God in three persons one more time. Have we worshiped today? <laughs> we have worshiped today. First of all, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers, those of you who have been moms, those of you who have birthed, those of you who didn't birth, but you've cared and you've loved. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to you. Glory to God. I am so privileged to be here with uh, Pastor Haskin and First Lady Sylvia and the household of Faith Assembly. Amen. It is an honor and a privilege, and I don't take that for granted. And so I pray that as the Lord leads today, that we will get a chance to just worship God together. Will you pray with me? Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you, God, for your presence. Let your presence be here today in this time, in this part of the word. God, let you be glorified in everything that's said. Anoint my lips, God. Anoint my mind, God. And Father God, if I get in flesh, you step in. And God, I thank you, God, for ability for you to speak to your people today. Be glorified. And I pray, Father God, for clarity of speech, clarity of mind. And Father God, for ears that will hear your word, God. It's not my word, it's your word. And I pray, Father God, that you will hear us and have mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Um. For those of you who know, there is this thing called a newspaper. Now, for some of you younger people, you probably don't know what that is. It's a thing that we used to open up and we would get news. Now we get it on our phone, we get it on our tablet, we get all that. But in there was a time in which there was news columnists as well. And in news columnists, they would always have a different column that would have their opinion or special feature. And some of you who have been around for a little while, you all may have remembered in the Chicago Sun-Times, there was a columnist called Ann Landers. And she would do this Dear Abby thing. You all remember that? Those of you who uh, don't remember it is because you're probably born after 2002 in which that article no longer happened. But if you all were born between 1951 and that period of time, you would have known something about that newspaper. Uh, this column actually was syndicated and was streamed over 26 papers in the United States, major markets, not minor markets, but major markets. And Dear Abby was one of these people who had this great wit and understanding and wisdom, and people would write her from all over to get her opinions on things and get her advice. So there was one story that was submitted uh, many years ago. And in this, uh, it tells of a man who all of his life had actually put away $20 from his paycheck every time he got paid. He got paid on a weekly basis. He started this when he was around 15 years old. And at 15 years old, he started putting away $20. But instead of it being in the bank, he would stuff it in his mattress. So what would happen is that after he got married, he continued this particular 
uh, process in his life, but he never told anybody about this. He never shared that even with his wife. So after he had gotten sick and they had given him a diagnosis that said that he was going to soon die, uh, they basically, he knew he had a short window to live. And he made his wife have a conversation with him and to make a promise to him. He said, honey, I want you to promise me one thing. Now, promises were very important to this man, extremely important to this man. In fact, he had trust issues. That's why the money was in his mattress. And so his wife said, promise what? The man was very serious and he was very direct with his wife. And he said, I want you to promise me that when I'm dead, that you will take all the money that's in my mattress and you will bury it in my coffin. Because I want to take all my money with me. And although this was a strange request, because this wife loved her husband, she said, I promise. So the day that he passed, she went to the mattress and she was able to find that over the fort from 14 all the way to the point in which he died, which was around 72, there was money that had accumulated in this mattress. She knew that she wanted to keep her promise, right? Because promise keeping is very important. Would you agree with that? So she decided that she was going to gather all that money. The day that he died, she went to the bank, she deposited it, and then she wrote out a check and put it in the casket. Now, people tend to make promises and they break them, right? We have politicians all the time that break promises to us. They say they're going to do something and they don't do it. We have with our employers, sometimes they say, you're going to get the promotion or you're going to get a raise and they don't do it. Sometimes as husbands and wives, you promise some things that you're going to do differently and you don't do it. In our churches, we have the same issue. Sometimes we promise things are going to happen and it does not happen. We don't really mean to make promises and break them to one another. It's very rare in which we start out with the idea that we're going to break a promise, but it's hard for us to trust one another. Would you agree with that? Because of that, we find ourselves in a very human and cynical way where we go, yeah, okay, I promise, I promise. And then oftentimes when we promise to our children, particularly mothers and fathers, you remember you make a promise to your children and then sometimes because situations happen, finances change, life, we have to break those promises and that's hurtful to them. But one of the things that we can know that it's hard for us to trust one another, but I would also contend that sometimes it's hard for us to trust God with his promises. The Bible tells us there are about 8,810 promises in the scripture and though there are all these promises, we sometimes sit and wonder whether or not those promises are going to belong to us. We think, well, that's a good promise, but maybe only Mrs. Johnson deserves that promise. Or Mr. Peterson deserves that promise. But one of the things that we have to understand is that when it comes to the promises of God, he is not a man that he would lie. He is not a man that he will repent. And so as we approach Pentecost Sunday, it's right around the corner, we're going to dive deep into some promises 
that we can see in scripture, but sometimes our own memory, our own lack of trust, we forget the promises that have been made to us by God. And we're gonna see an example of some women who actually faced that problem. If you'll turn your Bibles to Mark, the 16th chapter, verses one through 11. So as the scripture continues to break out to us, it tells us of something that I think that I would hope that we would want to remember even on this mother day, even as we have probably broken promises, moms, of the things that we said that we would do, as we've broken promises, dads, as we said that we would do, sometimes we broke promises to one another, you know, that heart that you broke and you decided that you wanted to go another way. Sometimes you broke that promise to yourself. You know, the one that we make at the beginning of every year that we're going to lose so many pounds of weight, right? And then like by day five, we're right back to the same process that we were before. We've made promises, but God's promises are always in check. God's promises are always yea and amen. And I want us to today, if you will mind to turn to a friend, a neighbor, uh, a stranger that might be on your road and say, don't forget God's promises. Don't forget God's promises. In verses 1 through, 13, uh, 1 through 3, we see women, women who had experienced some great grief. These were women who were followers of Jesus. There were women who were actually at the three places in which the men were not. They had been at the foot of the cross. They had seen their friend, their teacher, their family member, the person that they love with their whole heart go through enormous pain and agony. Can you imagine this? You are now standing in front of the person that you love, your teacher, your friend, someone who you cared about, who they have now lashed, not just beat, but lashed in his back and taking out hunks of skin from his back. And then, you know, he, they put him on a cross, but the cross wasn't all shellac. You know how what we do, what we do with furniture in our house, we, we have a little shellac there because we don't want the thorns, we don't want the thickets, we don't want the pieces of wood to come into our back when we sit down, right? But that wasn't the case for Jesus because the cross that he had wasn't shellacked. It was filled with pieces that were erupting and that was digging into his skin. They imagined, just imagine with me for a moment, that they actually saw their friend, their buddy, their teacher, their loved one sit standing on a cross that they had taken railroad nails you know the same kind of nails that you lay down for a railroad track and actually put it in his hands and put it in his feet and then allowed him to actually have to be stood up and trying to allow his whole body to go against the gravity that was there. Can you imagine what he's experiencing at this time where he can hardly breathe and now there is blood that's beginning to form in places that are not supposed to form. You find that there is now his kidneys are not functioning the way that they should. You see now that the blood that's in his skull because the crown that they placed upon his head were filled with these thorns that were actually put into his skull and he's bleeding. This is your friend. This is your teacher. This is the person that you love. And these women who were at the cross saw the agony that Jesus experienced. 
they didn't remember that he said as he taught that these things would happen. They had forgotten the promises, so their hearts were sad. Have you ever had a loved one pass and you had to go through the process of trying to prepare for their arrangements and how tough that felt at the time? Because you had to do it because it was a part of the process. These same women where only one man who had been a follower of Jesus was at the cross, but these same women followed Joseph Ar Armidus and also Nicodemus to the, to the tomb in which Jesus was going to be buried. They followed him because now they had to take his body and the other thieves down because the scripture says that Sabbath was approaching. And you know that good Jewish people were never going to do anything that was work related during the Sabbath. So even though the scripture will tell us in Luke and describes that also in John that they actually had some spices that were there in the tomb and it says that Nicodemus wrapped his body the actual embalming or the oils and the things that were mixed up in there were not present at the time and the women knew that but it was too late for them to do anything because Sabbath had come and they didn't remember the promises all they knew is that they were in grief. And I want to tell you guys right now that there are times in your life that you're going to be dealing with grief and you're going to be dealing with loss and you're going to be dealing with some things that are pretty tough in your life. And I want to remind you to remember, don't forget the promises of God. Because at that time, they weren't thinking that he said that I'm going to rise again. They didn't remember that. They remembered their friend, their teacher, the person that they loved on the cross. And all that they could deal with was grief. So as we approach this particular verse, we see now that the Sabbath has ended. But at the end of Sabbath, there's only a short period of time before it's dark. And these women had not prepared to prepare Jesus' body. They didn't know all this was going to happen because very quickly they went from the Lord's Supper to the point that he's in the garden to the point that he's arrested and has an amazing ridiculous justice system on his side in which they just found him guilty and now he's on a cross with some other criminals and so they didn't remember the promises that were made to them they didn't remember what it said in mark 9 30 to 32 where he says that i as i'm teaching you the son of man will be delivered into the hands of man. They will kill him and he will be killed, but he will rise in three days. They didn't remember that because it would have been Friday. They had seen their friend be literally harassed, beaten, suffering. And you and I, when we're in the midst of grief, we don't always remember the things that Jesus has said. Because he said in John 16, 20 through 22, he says, truly, truly, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. He said in Psalms 30 and 5 that his anger is yet for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping will endure for the night, but joy will come in the morning. 
they didn't remember that just like sometimes you and I don't remember when we're going through our loss, when we're going through our grief, when we're going through our painful times. We don't remember the promises of God that says that I will be able to take off the robe of heaviness and put on the garment of praise. We don't remember those promises just like these women didn't remember the promises. But these are powerful women because look what they do. When the Sabbath is over, they had already bought these spices that night, but it was too late for them to go to the tomb. So early in the morning, they go to the place where Jesus is laid. Will you listen to the beautiful perspective of these women? They had gathered the spices, the proper spices that needed to be done because in Jewish culture, they did not embalm like the Egyptians do, like we know today. So whenever a person died, they basically were wrapped in these fragrances. They were wrapped in myrrh. They were wrapped in an uh, uh, a aloe oil in order for the body that is now decaying to not be so offensive in the smell. They knew because they were there at the time that they had taken many men to take a cave that was his tomb and rolled this huge boulder in front of it. But these women, because they had grief, but they loved God. They had grief and loss and sorrow, but they knew what it was to love this master and to serve him. They had put together these spices and they decided that they were going to go to the grave. But one thing when they were coming along the way, they began to ask one another, who's going to roll away the stone? It's just a few of us. Who's going to roll away the stone? Have you ever been in the point which you still try to serve the Lord in the midst of the depth of your broken heart? Had you ever found yourself trying to serve people in the midst of your stormy times? Have you found yourself in a place trying to figure out how am I going to serve God when I'm feeling so bad? Well, you can identify with these women who were coming in the midst of this dark time. It said that very early in the morning that they left. And by the time they got to the tomb, it was finally daylight. But a tomb is very dark. They knew that it was going to be a heavy boulder, but they kept walking. They knew that it was going to be difficult for them to get to the body, to the anoint, the body of Jesus. But they kept walking anyway because they trusted God in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their loss. So if you look here further, they arrive, but they're looking down because verse 3 says, that they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us in the entrance of the tomb? But verse four says, looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled away. Sometimes in the midst of our grief, we're so busy looking down, we're so busy addressing the sorrow. Our depression is real, guys, depression is real. And, and, and sometimes we're so busy looking down that we can't already see that God had already worked it out for them even before they came to the place. They just had enough faith to keep walking to bring the spices to their savior, to their teacher, to their loved one. And as you look at the scripture, it says how that they saw it rolled away and it was extremely large. I think Mark puts that addition in there to let us know that this is not little, little bitty rocks. 
Because remember, they saw many of the men having to push that stone in the first place. Well, they entered the tomb, the scripture says, and they entered the tomb and they saw a young man sitting on the right. Now, can you imagine this? This is a darkened tomb. There are no windows, guys. There's no light switch. They come into this empty tomb thinking that they're going to see the decaying body of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they had forgotten the promise. They came in there to do their duty. And when they found them, they see a man in a white robe. And what happens there? It says that he began to tell them things that they should have known. He says to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who's being crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Behold, here is the place where he lays. I love this passage because it shows how God is so merciful to us. Even in the time that we forget his promises to us, even when we forget the word of God to our lives, that God still comes with a messenger that says, hey, 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 he's not here. I, I know you might have forgotten the promise, but he is risen. Guess what? Just like he said. And sometimes when we're dealing with that, we're coming to this morning shock like they did. They didn't expect to see an angel. They didn't expect to see Jesus' body gone. Have you ever had morning shock where you turn on the radio and you hear about the newest tragedy that has occurred and your heart gets sick? Have you ever had a call early in the morning from a family member that says, hey, so-and-so is in the hospital. Hey, so-and-so didn't make it. Hey, so-and-so this, so-and-so that. Go down to the courtroom because so-and-so got arrested last night. We experience all of these things because we go through this morning shock where we forget about the promises of God. They didn't expect the stone to be rolled away, but I wonder if you can relate to this morning shock and know that they had to believe something different than what they said. John, the 14th chapter and the 13th of the 14th verses that whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father will be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. How often do we forget that? In the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our struggle, when the light bill has come due and now your lights are out, when the gas bill comes and it's too hard to pay, when you're dealing with challenges in life and you try to remember, but you forgot all of the promises that God has made to us. Lamentations, the third chapter, 22nd through the 23rd verse reminds us that God's love, his loving kindness never ceases. His compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Even in the morning shock, his compassions are new every morning, even when we blow it the night before. His compassions are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. What a mighty God that we serve who has a faithfulness to us even when we are unfaithful, even when we don't remember his promises. He will remind us again of his faithfulness to us. So we don't want to forget his promises when we're in grief and we 
We don't want to forget his promises when we're in mourning shock, but we also don't want to forget his promises when we're receiving a message. If you look at verse 6, it says that, and he said, this angel, or Jesus, depending upon which perspective you're looking at, do not be amazed, for you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who had been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they had laid him. He is showing to us. Don't be alarmed, first of all. Jesus is risen, and this is the proof, because he's not here. And then... What else did he say? He says in verse 7, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you in Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. Jesus already had told them that he was going to not be in the grave. He had already told him what was going to go on. They had already known it. And that's why we have to remember the promises of God, even when the word is being preached, even when we're in our private time, in our devotionals, we have to remember the promises because First, Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all scripture is God breathed and is used for, for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every work. How can we be equipped if we don't remember the promises? We need to know that every word of God is meaningful for us. And Second Peter, the first chapter in the third verse says that by his divine power, God has given us everything for a godly life. And we've received all of this coming to know him and the one who called him by the means of marvelous glory. And because of the glory and excellence, he has given us these precious promises and that these promises will enable you to share his divine nature, escape the world's corruption because of human desires. I'm so grateful because even in this message that they get, God has also given them a mission. And we have to not forget, not only in our grief, we have to not forget his promises, not only when we deal with shock. We have to not forget God's promises when we're hearing the message but we have to not forget God's promises when we're on a mission for God. Verse 9 says that at the first, even after the women, according to verse 8, began to feel afraid and scattered, Jesus appeared to Mary again on the road and reminded her of the message that she needed to say to the people. And what happens? She goes and she does the mission. Have you ever been assigned to do something that you felt like you were ill-equipped to do? Think about it. This is a woman, a Jewish woman in a culture in which she could not even come to court and be believed on her own. Because the patriotic system of this world at that time would not believe the testimony of a woman. We are so blessed today, women of God, that we can speak a word of truth, the promises of God, and people will listen. And God will authenticate it because the anointing is on your life. And the anointing is on your life. And you brothers, you are able to speak with power because God has already given you the authority. And sometimes in our fear of whatever we think that people might think about us 
or think about what we say or how we say things, we tend not to follow the mission that God has given to us. What did he say in, in Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20? He says that I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. Do we not remember the promises when you know that you encounter that person in the store every week and you're not sure that they're saved? but you're just gonna assume that they're not, or that they are, or maybe I'm just too tired to talk to them about Jesus. Even though I might see a building burning, and I see people in the first floor, but the building is burning on the second floor, wouldn't I normally run right in and say to the people who are on the first floor, get out, there's danger. But yet, witnessing is one of the things that we're promised that there is a crown for us for witnessing, and yet we will not even witness to the person that we know doesn't know Jesus. This was a hard thing to ask of Mary, to go to tell some grieving men who were hiding out in the place to go and tell them that Jesus wanted to meet them in Galilee, that his body was not there. And the scripture says that even when she told him, they didn't believe her. You know why? Because they had forgotten the promises. They had forgotten what Jesus said. He said that I'm not going to be here always. This is a borrowed tomb for me. This is not a place that I'm going to lay. This is a place only going to have my body for three days and then I'm going to rise again. I wonder how many of you are like these women who were forgetting the promises in their grief, forgetting the promises in their shock, forgetting the promises while the message is going on and forgetting the promises in the mission and you've been afraid. God's got promises for each in every one of you. Those things that you've laid before the Lord, the things that you said will never happen, but God says, I told you, I made the promise. This wasn't your promise that you made to you because you know how unreliable you are, but I made this promise to you. Hope again, my brother. Hope again, my sister. The promises of God are yea and amen. And what did God say? He says, that which I said it, I will do it. We have the confidence of knowing that the promises that God has given us to us is going to come to pass. I want you to think for a moment. Will you close your eyes for just a moment? Think about the promise that God has made to you in your life, in your career, in your family, in your education, in your business, in your heart, that he said that he would save your entire household and you're wondering how they will be saved, but they will because God does not lie. The thing that he told you that he put you on the road to do, think about that right now. The thing that you decided that I'm too old or I'm too young, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough connection, but God says, I've got everything for you. Think about the promises that God has made you. Don't forget those promises. As you have this in the front of your mind, I want you to lay it before Jesus right now. Will you do that in this moment? Just speak to him about the thing that he has promised to you. Just a few minutes to yourself. Just speak to him about the promises that he's made to you.
Now I want us to ask God for forgiveness, for not believing the promises and not remembering what he said. And then I need you to hope again. You can open your eyes. Keep that in your heart. One of the things that I want to leave this with you is that you don't know the impact that your life will have when you follow God's promise and do his mission. There was a young man who used to ride one of our elevated trains here in the Chicagoland area. And he would pass by this area and this couple of houses were there and then a couple of apartments. And for just several weeks, he was riding by and he would see this woman, an older woman who was in a bed. You could tell that she was sick. You could tell that she was by herself. He tried to figure out where on that block was and try to identify her address. And he sent her a card, not knowing how that would be received. And the card was simply said that, I ride the elevated train. I've seen that you've been sick. I'm praying that God will restore you. Several weeks later, he was riding the elevated train, and he passed by that particular place, but he didn't see the woman in the bed anymore. There was a light there, though, and she had written a sign saying, bless you. Your life, if you remember God's promises, can have an impact that's beyond your imagination, your obedience to God's word that you've forgotten, but now we've got to remember just like these women did, is going to be powerful. And you never know what God has in store for you. We bless you, God.